grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our consideration on the Stewardship Sunday is taken from is our epistle lesson, 1 <coughs> Peter chapter 4. I want you to take a, a couple of moments and think what do you think are the top three things that the average person does not want to hear a preacher talk about. Not what you don't want to hear about, although maybe it's the same thing, but what are the top three things that you think the average person does not want to hear a pastor preach about? I'll give you just a few moments to, to formulate top three. I'd be shocked if most of you didn't have somewhere on your list money. People don't want to hear a sermon, don't want to hear a pastor talk about money. It's kind of a cliche, isn't it? That that's the, the reason people give for avoiding church, or the excuse, we, we could say, oftentimes, is that, oh, all you hear about is money. Church just wants your money. The, the preacher just wants your money. Money, money, money. Now, to be fair, Jesus talked a lot about money. The Bible talks a lot about money. And why shouldn't it? Money is a major thing in our lives. But that's not what you're going to hear today. Even though it would be very appropriate to talk about money on a stewardship Sunday, we're not going to discuss money. Perhaps you noticed that was the common thread with our three lessons. All three are about stewardship, but none of the three <coughs> mention money. That's because stewardship is not mostly or primarily about money. Really, a stewardship is about grace. And we have the privilege of being stewards of God's grace. <clears throat> grace is a powerful thing. It, it's a life-changing thing. It's something that the unbelieving world has a really hard time understanding. Now, th this is really what defines the Christian church, this, this concept of, of grace. But those who don't have faith in Christ have a really hard time understanding grace because it's so foreign to them. It's really, other than with your relationship with God, grace is foreign to you, too. There's not a lot of grace out there, is there? Very, very little in the other parts of our lives, we find grace. I'll give you a few examples. Number one, your job. You may have the world's kindest, most loving boss. But your employment is not based on your boss loving you with a blind love. It's if you have that situation, you are in a remarkable situation. Now, your, your employment is based on you doing the job you're supposed to do. If you don't do that job, your boss does not have an endless supply of grace and forgiveness for you, does he? Or she. You receive promotions, you receive raises, not simply because your employer is so good and gracious, but because you do. You do it well. And if you don't, you get fired. There's no grace there. Sometimes people, perhaps even you, have been fired even when you did do a good job. There's very little grace when it comes to jobs, employment, making a living. I'll give you another example. Friendships. You love your friends. I love my friends. <coughs> But there is, and it's hard to know how much, but there, there is an amount, isn't there? An amount of betrayals or, or even just minor annoyances 
that, that if that point is reached with a friend, we're ready to end that friendship. We have. Most of us in our lives have ended friendships. We haven't had a never-ending supply of grace for a friend. There's a point where we're done. We've had the same thing done to us, some of us, where friendships have been ended. We have been let go as a friend. There wasn't a whole lot of grace in that. There's no grace in the way our society is structured. We have the haves and the have-nots. And in most cases, the have-nots have very little chance of ever becoming the haves. I just read a recent survey that said, now only 23% of Americans, only 23% still believe that the American dream is common. You know, the classic rags to riches story is common. There's just not a lot of grace out there in the world. We don't encounter grace on a regular basis, and that's what makes it so hard for those outside of the church to understand what we're really about. You see this in the way the church or the way Christianity <coughs> is portrayed in pop culture and the media. It's a super common. Our beliefs are summarized this way. If you do bad things, you go to hell. If you don't do good things, you go to hell. That's how Christianity is so often summarized by those who don't understand grace. And they couldn't be more wrong. They couldn't be farther from the truth. But they just have no concept of grace. And so they don't understand our message. They don't understand what we're about. When people do understand it, you know, when they really truly understand grace, well, that probably means they're already well along the way to being born again. Perhaps they already have that little spark of faith. If a person truly understands that he has grace from God through Christ Jesus, he is a Christian. He is a, a believer. Grace changes everything. It even changes our concept of what we have and how we have it and why we have it. You see, it, it's grace that makes us stewards. To be a steward is to, to be entrusted with something and, and take care of it. Well, you and I, when we reflect on what God's word says, specifically God's law, we realize that we don't deserve anything good. It means any good thing I have in my life is simply a product of God's grace, of him loving me even though I don't deserve it. All sorts of things, right? I mean, there's some obvious ones. Faith, right? Obviously, clearly, faith is a gracious gift from God. It's not something that I manufacture. Salvation, clearly, not something I do myself. I'm incapable of it. It's a gift from God. But also all those material things, right? All of your possessions, all of my possessions. Our families, our children, our educations. Our jobs, our vacations, clearly the list is endless because God's grace and love is endless. He has made us stewards of all of those things. He has also made us, his grace has made us stewards of grace itself. That's what 1 Peter is talking about here in our lesson. Serve one another, each according to the gift he has received as good stewards of the many forms of God's grace. God's grace has made us stewards of grace itself. It's something we've been given. Now keep in mind what a steward is. The steward was the, the main servant in a household. He was the, you could think of him as the household manager. The, the owner, the master, entrusted everything to him. Here is my home. Here, here, is, our, here is access to all of my phones. Here's my family. Everything. You are in charge. And the steward had really two responsibilities. To protect that which is his master's, but also to use that which is his master's. 
We remember the parable of the talents, where three servants were, were given certain amounts. The one servant just went and, and, and buried that treasure in the ground. And his master wasn't happy. His master didn't think of him as being faithful. He didn't use it. Should have at least taken it to the bank and earned some interest. We are responsible for what we are stewards of. We are also to use it. Stewards of God's grace, we are to use that grace. And we do so by loving others. <coughs> Above all, Peter says, Love each other constantly, because love covers a multitude of sins. Here's the antidote to the sickness of our world. Here's the beauty to, to drive away the horror of our world. We can be instruments of love. We can be instruments of grace. This is supposed to be our defining characteristic as Christians that we are those who love. And remember, love, as the Bible defines it, not warm and fuzzy feelings, but doing what's best for others, whether they deserve it or not. Not even taking that into account, just loving, doing what's good for other people. That is supposed to be what defines us, how people recognize us and know us. The more and more, it seems, the world does not see Christians as those who love. Now, we, of course, cannot completely control how people view us. And sometimes the way they look at us is not fair. It has nothing to do with our actions. <coughs> but perhaps we do bear some responsibility. The church as a whole, Christianity as a whole, the fact that so much of our society no longer views us as those who love. The power of love it is maybe the most memorable part of these verses. Probably the most memorable phrase, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. What does that mean? Love covers a multitude of sins. Let's start with what it doesn't mean. That does not mean that it doesn't matter how much I sin as long as I'm showing love to other people. It doesn't matter that, it doesn't mean that, that if I'm being loving to some people in my life, well, that makes up for me not being loving to other people. It doesn't mean that I don't need to repent of my sins as long as I'm showing some love to some people in my life. No, the Bible certainly is very clear with us about the seriousness of sin. The Bible tells us how we are to approach sin. That when we see a brother or sister in Christ who appears to not be repentant, we are to talk to them, to try to bring them to repentance. The Bible makes it clear that where there is no repentance, there is no faith. There is not a Christian. So Peter is in no way implying that your sins or my sins don't matter as long as we're loving other people. But to the world, it almost is that isn't it? <laughs> to the world, if I am loving people, well, it's easier for the world than to look past my words. If we're showing true love to others, it's easier for the world to ignore us. It's easier for the world not to call us hypocrites it's easier for the world not to completely dismiss what we have to say because of our actions. <coughs> Love covers a multitude of sins. That means the world out there is more likely to listen to us when we talk about grace and love if we're actually showing grace and love. Even though we sin. Because we will sin, right? Right? As hard as you and I try, we're still going to sin. We can get better, certainly, and that should be a goal. But I'm never going to completely stop sinning, and neither are you. I'm going to sin, and the world is going to see my sin. But if the world also sees me genuinely loving other people, it might listen. 
Why would anyone listening to us talk about love and grace when they, if they don't see us showing love and grace? Love does <coughs> cover a multitude of sins in the eyes of the world. We are stewards of God's grace by showing grace and love to others. And we do so with this multitude of gifts that God gives to us. Serve one another, Peter says, each according to the gift he has received. As a steward of the many forms of God's grace. Notice how Peter doesn't put it. He doesn't say, serve one another if you have received a gift. Well, there's no if. We can't exclude ourselves from this. God gives us gifts. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the different talents and abilities and even, even desires to get better at things that God has given to us. Today is our, our stewardship Sunday. We deliberately this year wanted to have a stewardship Sunday that wasn't about money. Because stewardship is not primarily or mostly about money. It's about grace. It's about loving and serving others. God wants us to use everything he's given to us to serve him. Most often the way he wants us to serve him is by serving others. And he gives us gifts to do that. In your mailboxes today, you'll find a time and talents um, survey that our stewardship committee put together. It's a list of, of, of different ways in which members of divinity can serve here within our congregation, all sorts of different ways. You have musical skills. Uh, if, you would, if you would like to help with cleaning the church, if you would like to help with Sunday school, all sorts of different ways. Because stewardship is not just about money. It's about using our gifts to serve God and serve others. And part of the process of doing that is figuring out what gifts we have. This place of grace, Divinity Lutheran Church, is also a safe place. It's a safe place for you to try. Try various things. See if it's something you enjoy. See if it's something you have a gift at or something in which you, you, you're interested in developing a gift for. Perhaps you are a Christian who has not been blessed with a lot of material possessions. Perhaps you don't have a lot of money. Well, perhaps you don't have a lot of money left over after you take care of all the other responsibilities your God has given to you. And you're sometimes embarrassed by the amount you put in the offering plate. Please don't. Don't be embarrassed of what you put in the offering plate. Don't be ashamed if your, your monetary offering is less than someone else's. Because God has given you and he's given me so many other ways in which we can be stewards, in which we can serve him. Things and ways that have nothing to do with money. And oftentimes, those ways are more satisfying, can feel more satisfying than putting money in a plate. Having personal interactions with other human beings. You know, being active and involved in your congregation. I do want to say, though, we are in no way implying that serving at divinity is the only way for you to use your gifts and talents. That this is the only way to serve God. Not at all. God's given you opportunities to serve your family, to serve your neighbors. On that time and talents survey sheet, there's, there's even a space for you to uh, fill in something that we haven't thought of. Perhaps you can think of a way uh, that we can serve our neighborhood more. We're always interested in hearing that. How can we show the people around Divinity Lutheran Church that we are truly loving? <coughs> because then we can show them what grace is. That's what it means to be stewards of God's grace. To use it. To give it to other people. Amen. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Please stand.
We confess our common faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated as we collect our thank offering. Please also sign the friendship registers in your hand. 